Yeah. Sweet. All right. Well, let's uh let's get right into talking. So we're talking to this box set, or uh, that's, that's no, what we're, well, we're doing the on. box set, but also mm-hmm. the Hard Rock Night. Uh, his uh, covers of Beatles and Wings and John Lennon uh, due we're... November twelfth, twenty twenty one. But as we say in Montreal, uh, bonjour, Chip. Uh, comment allez vous? Ah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I got a lot of music coming up, guys. I'm pretty lucky in this day and age of uh, it's unprecedented. So. Uh, what, what you do if you can't go out and play shows all the time, which I've been doing, by the way, I just got up a two month tour with Faster Pussycat, the straight out of quarantine tour, which was very well attended. Uh, but now it looks like there's um, s- some more uh, mandates and restrictions coming up for a lot of the bands until next year. Yep. So what do we do that we, to navigate these waters? All the bands, not just me. We go in the studio, make records. That's it. Record. As yeah, so. you should be. So, Jeremy, I'll let you start off. You've got a bunch of questions about this box set. Well, we'll we'll get to the Beatles stuff first. But but you know, Jeremy's a huge fan. He's got all these questions about the box set that he wants to geek out on first, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, overall, it's just a such it's such a fantastic collection of songs. I mean, the band is really prolific. I mean, listen, you guys are legends in my book. At the end of the day, so it's like one thing I want to know is, you know, any of these songs? Do you recall? You know, were they rewritten or parts maybe used for other songs on the major label release, or what was this? What was the process of getting these songs all together? No, they're all they're all songs that were written in the early days when we were kids. Yeah, but then and, later on, like, did you ever like go back and take some of those parts and then put them on like you know the the later stuff, or no. this is all fresh shit that's no one's ever heard before? That's correct. Yeah, it's all fresh stuff. Donnie and I were writing machines. It's all we did every single day. Wow. We'd sit in a little apartment or a friend's house, wherever grandma and grandpa McNulty's. I, I named all the places that we recorded. Those were the titles of the records. Right. And basically, it was, uh, you know, the early songs. It's the, you know, just, they're like embryos, you know, the beginning of a relationship. And we started off putting these songs together. And then we wrote more and more material. We just kept coming up with stuff. And I saved everything that I, from those early sessions. And when I was approached, to put out uh, the, the demo box set, uh, I certainly was a little reluctant. I wasn't sure because I thought those songs would just sit in the vault forever. Uh, but then after talking with Donnie, uh, he's, there was a lot of, he loved the energy of those of the, of the demos. And he thought it was a great idea. And we're in the middle of a, a shutdown when nobody's working, there's nothing coming in. When we mm. thought maybe it was in our best interest to put it out there. Uh, it was a good label. Uh, Brian Pereira over at Cleopatra has always been one of those guys that grabs on this stuff and takes chances. Mm-hmm. I got a wonderful relationship with him. And we just uh, put all those songs together. I did it all by myself, by the way. I didn't ask, ask Donnie to do anything. He already did stuff by singing and, and co-writing those songs with me. I, I didn't need him for anything else. I went over to a friend of mine in, here in Chicago. His name is Chris Diamonds. He uh, runs a studio called Stone Cutters. He's worked with Ozzy and Styx and Alice nice. Cooper. And, and he did the whole Kiss Revenge record. And then he's, this guy's really got you. He's the real McCoy. And I sat down with him for about two weeks and just cleaned up all those uh, dad tapes. Listen, I couldn't add. I couldn't subtract. It was you get what you get. Just wanted to clean it up and make it presentable to the fans. And then when it was all said and done, I had 40 songs, right? And I have more material, by the way, than that. We, Donnie and I have written mm. a lot of material. But those 40, I thought, were a great representation of Enough Snuff in its early days and its formidable days. And we put that out there. And basically, it was a, it was good for us because we got a chance to put a record out there and, uh, and be creative and show how we were in the old days. Uh, but it's a bandage on a gunshot wound. Okay, that's if we weren't going through this shutdown and pa- and pandemic, we I, I, perhaps the, we, we this record might not see the light of day, Jeremy. Wow. Uh, but at the end of the day, when I put it out, it's uh, it was very therapeutic, and I think it was for Donnie as well. We're happy to have the record out there, and more importantly, for the fans out there to get a chance to hear stuff in its early in- inceptions. Imagine bands. I'm not putting this in the same league as these bands, uh, but I'm we're all swimming in the same lake. But imagine like a a band like a Cheap Trick or Queen or Mark the Hoople or Sweet or any you know s- Squeeze, uh, you know, putting a record out like that with early stuff. They wouldn't do that. They just went, they, no. maybe they weren't as, I don't want, I'm sure certainly those bands were as profound and prolific as we were, uh, but I, maybe they wouldn't, they'd be afraid to show those scars and those warts. 
uh, we embraced it. And I think in the, at the end of the day, it turned out to be a nice thing. Records selling like you wouldn't believe. People yeah. are going to rec- get the record. Uh, and everybody knows it's early stuff. No one's looking at it going, oh, man, it doesn't sound like the first, you know, 10 and up snuff albums with the great production. Of course it's not. It's yeah. two guys in the bedroom smoking pot with no electricity <laughs> plugging in when the, when the electric goes on and, until two o'clock in the morning and, and trying to put down our ideas, uh, or pen to paper to tape. And that's exactly what we did. Well, well would you ask- ever consider getting back together and like, you know, getting into a studio, a proper production and doing a couple of these new songs as part of like a new enough album or something? Well, we just did, uh, you know, on the last enough snuff album, our brainwashed generation, Donnie and I put a song out mm-hmm. right. uh, we, we, and it sounds great. And, and uh, you know, I had a wonderful producer out in Las Las Vegas working with us. Uh, Is there Donnie any of these Vegas. songs specifically like on the box that you think, ah, oh, damn, you know, that would actually be really good if we went back in and did it. I I, I think that, uh, you know, listen, do you want to get back with your old girlfriend and drink her cat daiquiri? I, I think it'll be a shortcut. Uh, sometimes on a lonely night, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, I think, it's... I think we crossed that bridge already to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, listen, the songs I'm really proud of and Donnie and I were writing machines back then, especially Donnie is coming up with just great stuff. I can consider him the quintessential vocalist of our generation. I think it's sad, uh, you know, sometimes you're judged by your character and not yeah. by your work, which mm-hmm. is a, a shortcut to thinking. That guy's fantastic. He's a, w- a wonderful singer songwriter. Um, we did it for 30 years, guys. Why do I owe more than that? Yep. You yeah. know, he left the band for the third time in 2013. I accepted it. He told me, he says, Chip, if you're going to carry on the name Enough Snuff, you should go out there and sing the songs. At least the people are going to know it's Enough Snuff. And I've done that. And the fans have spoken. Yeah. We haven't had any records in 25 years charting in Billboard. The last record did 152 with a bullet. I've toured around the country with Ace Freely, yep. with Jack Russell's Great White. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, M3 Festival, yeah, which was great, yeah, right, which is where Festival, we saw you. You know, out with, with you know Cheap Trick and Bullet Boys and Tesla and you name the bands that are out there. We went out with every single one of them. We play with them all. We got a great relationship. I yep. think I deserve to to have to uh, to be able to go out there and work and play these shows. Yeah, it keeps the name of the band out there, and it still helps my brother navigate the waters. It gives him uh, a room to move forward. Um, anything. Listen, when uh, Phil Collins took over in Genesis, it was Peter Gabriel first. Right. And he left, and Phil came in there and took the seat, and that's the template that I use right there, guys. There's no other band that would do it. Stone mm-hmm. Temple Pilots, Foreigner, Sticks. The list goes on and on of bands that went out and found fabulous singers to do it. Why should I be faulted for carrying on the tradition of the band that I put together 37 years ago? It's a blessing from the good Lord. I want to go out there and play the songs and the fans want to hear them. And every single night I listen to the people. If it sucked and people were going, you know, it's questionable the way the band sounds right now. I, you know, maybe Chippy should just like go out and find another guy to sing these songs or, or just go out solo. I would definitely say, okay, you know what? You, you made a, a nice point here. I think I'm doing an okay job right now. And I'm proud of, of the legacy of Enough's Enough. Yep. And I'm glad the fans have spoken up and they went out and bought the records and they come out to the shows every single night. And at the end of the day, who cares who drives the bus? Let's get to the picnic, guys. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> now, just, just before I get over to Hard Rock Night, I, I want to ask you on that box set, the, on that first disc, the the early early demos it sounds like frigo playing on those was he playing on those or did you have these sort of demos realized and when it was time to record he had to sort of mimic what was on these early demos so basically who's playing on that was it derek or i didn't mimic him Listen, exactly <laughs> this guy used to talk to Eddie van halen's mom and dad when he was a young kid okay 15 years old call up van halen on the phone how cool is that and his parents would talk to him Wow. Of course, later on, I got a chance to hang out and jam with Eddie, with a wonderful guy, one of the quintessential guitar players of our generation, and a great songwriter and singer as well. No one really talks about that. They just talk about his incendiary guitar playing. Mm. I think that Derek Frigo was uh, perhaps one of the greatest guitar players of that of that era. Before he joined Enough Snuff, Mick Jagger wanted him. He didn't want to play with Mick, because, and he loved the Rolling Stones, but he couldn't be controlled. They had a dinner together, and Mick goes, I'm not sure I can control this guy. And, and wow. obviously, and, and, and Derek's had a wonderful sense of balance on guitar. Yeah. But he was a young kid. He's full of piss and vinegar. And, he, and at the end, he goes, hey, guys, I'd rather be in Enough's Enough. And listen, maybe that was a, a mistake on his part. Let's talk about confusing motion with progress. Imagine him playing with Mick Jagger. He would have been huge. But mm. he went with his heart, and he wanted to play with Enough's Enough. And you can't 
there's not one guitar player I know. When we did all those records in the studio and everybody came by to see us, whether it was George Lynch or the guys in Cheap Trick or, or Howard Stern. Or, yeah, or any of the big heavyweights that would come out and see us. Dweezil Zappi used to come out and see the band all the time. He hailed us, okay? Him and Jennifer wow. Connelly would show up in the studio and just sit for hours and watch Derek play. Uh, you just can't mimic a cat like that. He just had a wonderful uh, gift on yeah. guitar. So he just I had such a great demos. melodic style of playing. And it's just, like you said, you can't really mimic that. Yeah, to answer your question, guys, I'm sorry for the long answer, but I'm excited when you asked that because – yeah, uh, most of the guitar and drums on those demos is me. <laughs> I got to be wow. honest, it was just Whoa. Donnie and I in the studio playing, and, and that was it. And there was uh, there was wow. no room for error. There was nobody to help us. We had a little drum machine, a little Fostex uh, four track or a Tascam four track that we recorded on. There wasn't much room to play, and we just wanted to get all our ideas down. So, I think on uh, on that stuff that you're talking about, Mitch, some of it is Frigo on there because we got him. He finally joined the band. Right. We were in, before we went to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, when we went to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin to record our uh, early stuff, uh, the, the guitar player was Alex Kane from Life, Sex, right. and Death. Mm -hmm. And Alex uh, ended up splitting to join Life, Sex, and Death, and we needed a guitar player. And we shopped all those demos that we did and couldn't get a bite from anybody. Just those nobody wanted to take a chance on us, all labels. And it was a weird time right there. It was a real change of the guard at that time with metal and hard rock and, and nobody knew what, what to call enough snuff because we were a, a combination of everything and without sound and modest, it was a, a alternative. It was pop. It was new wave. It was a, a old wave, tidal wave, whatever you want to call it. There was some metal in there. So we asked Derek, a management company came to me. So we want to get this guy, Derek Frigo to come down. He used to be in a band called Le Mans. Uh, can we get him to come down in the studio and play? I said, guys, he's out of control. You know, I love him. He's a wonderful kid. Uh, I just can't. I, you know, you'd have to put handcuffs on to go, oh, no, Chip, we got him for sure. We're just going to have him come down, play a couple of solos, and that's it. <laughs> he came down, played the solos, and then we sent those demos out. And within uh, a couple of weeks, we had a, a bidding war and wanted to sign the band. So wow. Derek was a big part of shape in the group. And those early demos that you're talking about, Mitch, he'd come down there and play the song once or twice. He'd hear the song, play the solo, and then sashay. <laughs> the guy had a gift. Remember, his wow. father was Johnny Frigo, play with Count Basie, Billy Holiday. We're talking about a wonderful musician right there. It was in his blood. And when he came down and played with Enough Snuff, he just knew exactly what we were doing. He listened to the melody line, listened to the bass. He knew how the songs were going, and he just he, he just hit his own timber. He just had it. Yeah, hmm. man. Yeah, because it's like you listen so to – great. You, you listen like Crazy Night or Cupid's Laughing or Help. It's it, like the even the, the tones of the guitar and stuff, it has that first album kind of sound to it, you know? Yeah, Crazy Nights. I remember he had me playing. I play guitar on that, by the way. I was playing the uh, the, uh, the solos with him. So I'd play a couple of, you know, eight bars, 16 bars, and then Frigo would come in and play and try to whip my ass, which he always did. <laughs> he liked the way I played because I'm fo I'm the old school a Aerosmith type, uh, type type of guy, you know? Right. So I think both guitars together, it's just sort of different side of the band. Uh, but boy, those early those early recordings. And I remember, uh, who's the singer from Cacophony? He was down there too. I had him engineering some of the stuff down in the studio. Cacophony? Uh, yeah. We had Marty Freeman and we had Jason Becker. So who was singing on that? Uh, there was another guy that was down there that worked out with them cats as well. Uh, another singer. I don't know. He, he had an Aussie tribute band. I can't think of his name right now. I got a brain cramp. Uh, but mm -hmm. he came down there and we did some demos with him and he did some of those. That was one of the songs where he helped me engineer. And I thought that was kind of nice, you know, showed a different style of the band because he focused on a, a heavy metal and hard rock. And uh, we were more of a pop band, but we were trying, we had balls. It was a you know, picture cheap trick in, uh, at two o'clock in the morning fight in an alley. So <laughs> I think that maybe it's not a good analogy. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, I, I think it's great. was it Peter was Marino. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who's that? It said it says a uh, band member is Peter Marino on Peter Marino. Record. That's it. There you Good go. Old Pete Marino. He's actually an Ozzy. Uh, I was called unauthorized Ozzy. He was down there and he was helping me engineer that crazy nights during those recordings. That uh, that was over at uh, 2231 Prairie here in lovely Blue Island, Illinois, where Moses left his sandals. Good moments over there. We had so much fun. No electricity, guys. We'd plug in. <laughs> when the electric would come on the hallways at 11 o'clock in the morning, we'd run an extension cord all the way through. And that's how we recorded. I'm not kidding you guys. I'm not trying to make it something bigger wow. than it was. Wow. And, and it would, at 2 o'clock in the morning, electric would go off in the hallways. We have no electricity until the next day, 11 o'clock <laughs> in the morning. We had not only that, we had no telephone. So Donnie climbed up the pole and hooked up electricity <laughs> for us. So 
We told all our constitu our constituents and, and mothers and fathers and friends, if you call us and somebody else picks up, just hang up the phone. And, wow. that, and that gave us telephone for about three, four months as well, too. Damn. And those other extracurricular activities oh, that were there my that, Lord. that pushed the boundaries of being in a rock and roll band. But it was all part of the whole thing. I wouldn't change one thing except perhaps uh, try to keep those extracurricular activities down to a minimum. <laughs> a, little, a little bit less. <laughs> By the way, Cacophony also had uh, Dean Castronovo on drums, who's now with Journey. So Yeah, I love Dean. What a solid drummer. He always has been great. Good friend of mine. Yep. We were managed love by him. Journey's manager, the great Herbie Herbert, for yep. 10 years. And I uh, had wonderful moments hanging out with those cats in the early days, let me tell you. Mm. Hey, I'm going to ask you just a random question, just because we mentioned Cheap Trick, because we always mention Cheap Trick in an Enough's Enough interview, but you had Pete Kamita for a bit. Yeah, we certainly did. We were rehearsing in a place in Tyama Park, a guy named Tiger Gibbs' house, old yeah. friend of mine. His mom and dad passed away, God bless him. And he goes, I got this house here, and I, you know, can you guys, could, you, if you want to rehearse in my basement, you can. So we brought all the equipment down. It was a couple blocks away from my mom and dad's house. And we started rehearsing down the basement. We needed a guitar player and a drummer. So we called Frank Leva, who played with the guy for the singer from Ted Nugent. And uh, he, he, and then he suggested, hey, why don't we call Kamita from Cheap Trick? So immediately Donnie and I went from just him and I by ourselves to having a couple of heavyweight guys who actually had a little credibility. Mm. And we played and rehearsed and played in this guy's basement for about six months we throw parties. We'd have a hundred people down there at five bucks a head and we'd sell cassette tapes at the show. I'd like to, I'd like to have some of those cassette backs. Okay. It'd be nice to have some those early recordings. Cause some of the stuff is, it was gone. It was just like, you know, down at a four track yeah. and Pete joined and when Pete was in the band for about almost a year, we did one session with him at Royal Recorders in Lake Geneva. And then uh, he just found himself where he, there was other things he wanted to do. And he just didn't have, the same excitement and uh and hunger is enough snuff when right. you this business guys if you didn't back then if you didn't want 24 7 365 days a year forget about it you're not going to make it that's yeah. going to happen and totally. that's all we did was we we breathed and ate rock and roll every single day and pete didn't make the fourth quarter but we stayed good friends and we had some good ideas and pete's responsible for some of the things that enough snuff did in those early days i i give him a lot of credit he was wonderful in cheap trick unfortunately uh he was living his life uh, vicariously through Pablo Escobar for a little while. And I think that's mm. the run. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Well, listen, uh, the uh, huge box that's available you could, uh, features unreleased all original material as Zenuff and V hone their songwriting craft. Uh, she's it features several rare and unseen photos of the band, many of them courtesy of veteran photographer Paul Natkin, and as well as yeah. liner notes penned by Chip and V. And, uh, everybody's and, full color. The, the the geez, this box like the vinyl looks ridiculously good. Yeah. And, and I'm not a vinyl is, guy, and and I look at this vinyl, I go, I kind of want that. That's kind of cool. It's yeah, like candy, it's psychedelic colored vinyl, <laughs> Mitch. Yeah, Brian Pereira and and Ken over at Cleopatra, those guys really know what they're doing, yeah. and. Uh, a shout out to Paul Natkin, too, because I called Paul. I've known him for years. He did Aerosmith. He did Rolling Stones. The guy's a fabulous photographer. There's other guys I could have went to. Um, Mark Weiss, another great guy out there. There's mm -hmm. there's three or four cats that out there that you can just call it upon them, and they're going to have the stuff you're going to look for back in those early days. But Natkin, just, he was incredible. He, come, he invited me over to his house. I went through all the photographs. I was blown away. He goes, whatever you want, Chip, you can use. And I sent all that stuff over to Cleopatra, and those guys sussed it out, and we were able to make things happen. The box set, I'll tell you, that really made a big difference on the record recording because it's early recordings and there's early pictures, but, boy, it certainly looks good. It, he really wet, wrapped that bow tie up really yeah. nice. You're not kidding. You can't and, go wrong and, with a good package. And, by the way, you get the whole thing for 60 bucks. It's, yeah. You know, if, if this was Guns N' Roses, it would be 1500 yeah. And it's 60 bucks. It's it's gorgeous. But let's get over to uh, Hard Rock Night. It's uh, it's sort of a Beatles tribute, but not just Beatles. We we touched the uh, on the solo bands, on John Solo. Uh, talk to me about the importance of the Beatles, because, you know, Howard Stern and others have called you the Beatles of our generation, have, have referred to your Beatleness before. Uh, did you finally just say, hey, let's just go out and do it. Let's just do the Beatles thing. It's another reinterpretation of what the Beatles are all about. We're not a tribute band. We got 20 albums out. Right, uh, true. But we always pay respect to our forebears, and the Beatles were one of the greatest bands of all time. And don't think it wasn't a challenge, guys, to get up there and sing those songs every single night. And, it's, and in the studio, 
I could have done it line by line, note for note, like the like the guys usually do a Beatles and do it like that. But anybody that's recording Beatles songs, they're not just singing it straight through yeah. all like they're playing it live. It's really tough, was, especially when you're using a four track. Yeah, that was my approach on this Beatles <laughs> record was to go in the studio and sing them just like I'm going to sing them live and leave all that little stuff that's in there. You know, any any uh, uh, wart scars and tattoos, just said, leave it the, just the way it is, you guys. And I think that we really captured something magical right here. It's a reinterpretation of what the Beatles were all about at the end of the day. Uh, and it was played heavy. Just picture, st- I mentioned this before, but Stone Temple Pilots and Cheap Trick Fight and Alley, and I come in there and break it up. That's the hard rock night, okay? Nice. And when, when uh, Frontiers approaches to do this album, they said, well, we uh, brainwashed Generation and Diamond Boy did such a good job for you guys. You think you got, would like to do another album? We, and I said, yes. And they sent us a contract for the next three albums. And we thought, wow, this is uh, very, uh, very nice of the label to take time out to want to talk to us. They have hundreds of bands on their label. They could yeah. go with anybody they wanted to, but obviously they, they uh, respected the friendship and loved the legacy of Enough's Enough. And uh, mm-hmm. when I sat down and talked to Tony Fennell and Tori Staff Reagan and Daniel Benjamin Hill, I said, what do you guys feel about doing a Beatle record? And they were hailing it. And I went in the studio immediately with the guys and just started laying down my, the songs I picked with Tony that I thought would be good for my voice that certainly wouldn't be, uh, that would be challenging, but I wouldn't be out of the realm of possibilities of making where it would still be uh, their Beatles songs and it, would, and it would still be strong and solid. And we recorded a lot of the stuff in Blue Island here over at my studio, Chip Snuff Studios, where I do my radio show on Monsters of Rock. And nice. we just bashed out songs every single day, Mitch. Listen, there was no cocaine laying around in pot, tons of alcohol or anything. We really were focused on the task. Well, that's a shame. Yeah, no kidding. You know, so we took some of the fun. <laughs> Damn it. What's, what's the point? We'll blow that label budget. Come on. Yeah, and I, you know, we, we started singing. I think Cold Turkey was one of the first tracks, and we, we listened to it. Oh, we were, the irony. And I said, let's leave it alone, you guys. You know, it is what it is. I, I'm hailing it. And then Tori came in and played the solos later on, because I play a lot of lead guitar on that record, okay? And then I pulled everything off there, because uh, Tori Stoffering has got a wonderful sense of balance when it comes to playing lead guitar. He's just he's a great melodic player mm. and uh, let him do his thing to it. And after we finished the record, we weren't sure where we were going to go with it. We we're going to mix it ourselves. And once again, went over to Stonecutter Studio, same guy that did the Kiss Revenge record and all that Ozzy stuff, uh, Chris Diamonds, and said, would you mix this? And he took about two weeks. He was pulling out Leslie's and putting them in the bathroom and all bringing out all the old vintage gear from back in the sixties and seventies. And boy, he really turned, he, he really massaged that record and made it a solid hard rock record that it's the first time you're going to hear the Beatles like it would be today. I think in my yeah. eyes, obviously McCartney and Lennon's beautiful pipes aren't there, but those songs are well-written. You, you have to be uh, yeah. a, a real genius to, to, uh, to wreck those songs. Uh, so this, the template was already there. And it took a lot of pressure off me because I have to come up with songs. I mean, all these records that Donnie and I have written and I've written by myself, boy, it's a real challenge right there. Uh, so to have the Beatles songs in, in my back pocket, to be able to play them. And we've already got, the fans have already mentioned in the past how Enough's Enough is a uh, Beatles influence. Uh, we got a lot of influences besides the Beatles, but one of the, you know, you, you, are, you are what you eat. Our parents played that, those records for years. And yeah. they seeped into our system. I think at the end of the day, people are going to be pleasantly surprised when they hear it. And I put the first video out as an animated video on YouTube right now. My buddy Wayne from Los Angeles shot it. It's absolutely fabulous. It's getting tons of hits. People have spoken. They want to see the band live. I think the we've been done a couple of shows around the United States, but one of the great shows that we're going to be doing, we'll be opening for Alice Cooper in February on the Monsters of Rock Cruise, and we're playing, uh, it'll be called The Beatles Rock Show, we're doing up the Beatles songs. That whole record will be done in its entirety, guys. Wow, that's ah, awesome. That is great. Damn, that's cool. And, and by the way, I like the fact that there's warts and all, because that's what was great about the early albums, because, you know, Charlie Watts just passed away. If you were to take Charlie Watts and the Stones in a studio now, they would correct all his stuff, and it would just ruin what he did. No, no, no. He'd be a drum machine, Mitch. He, yeah, he'd, he'd be, be a Lynn be, drum right now. So he'd so be it, easy drummer. I love well, Pro, that you kept the vibe. You have to have yeah, well, the vibe. Yeah, Pro Tools does that. On, on our record, we basically went in the studio, and it's everything's on two inch, and then we dro- we dropped over to Pro Tools after that. But yeah, at the end of the day, we wanted real performances. 
And I think yeah. sometimes when you get in there and you start scraping and cleaning up everything, you take away some of the beauty of what actually is was was recorded in the first place. Yeah. Uh, and I know a lot of bands do that. They want it to be picture perfect. I like leaving the blemishes on there. That's a real rock and roll record. Look, those early Aerosmith records or even the early Beatles stuff, you know, you're, there's some mistakes there. There's little notes you hear and you go, wow, is that beautiful? How did he do that? And mm -hmm. that's, that's the approach we took on this album, Hard Rock Night and Enough's Enough, is go in there, bash out those songs live. And then we and then when we go out and play live in concert, uh, people, will get, they'll hear that and they'll go, oh, that's what I got. It's a real yep. record. It's real live. It's uh, no tapes, no sequencers, no guys backstage hiding, playing the parts. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody under the stage with a keyboard? No, no, no keyboards? Yeah. There's no, no computer running? Not Come that on. there's anything wrong with that, because a lot of guys I know still, a lot of big bands still do that. Uh, Listen, I was at a... When I've seen the shows, that's what people want to see. They want to hear those songs. Like they remember the first time they fell in love, the first time they had sex, the first time something tripped their trigger. You want to get close to the real original as you can. Yeah. You do, but totally. I have to say there was one time I was at a sound check and over the monitor, they, or over the PA, it was check, check. I need more computer in the mix. And I just went, oh, God. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, let's not mention who they are. There's a lot of bands that do it. Let's not mention the band because there's no need to throw no, them under the no, bus. No, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but I just I just remember them going, uh, yeah, I need more uh, more computer in the mix. And I was like, no, no, you don't. No, yeah, when I hear more. people say, oh, man, you know, like that Eddie Trunk over at Sirius XM, wonderful friend of mine. Great guy. Uh, and listen, we go back a long ways. I, I, I know it's Montserrat Cruises. There's numerous moments where my wife and her little girlfriend who's a uh, a porn star would carry him back to his room where he couldn't even walk. Okay. So nice. he's a very good friend of mine. He's the first guy to say oh, it's a hundred percent real. But a lot of those bands he talks about and says that about it's not, there's little things that are happening in the show that are helping the show move along nicely. And you can't have six, seven guys in the band. We don't have the budget of, of Bruce Springsteen and the Rolling Stones. They have seven or eight guys up on stage and you got to get through those songs and you want them to sound close to the record. So uh, sometimes you need a little extra help, but most of the bands that are most of the rock bands and the metal bands and the pop bands that are out outside of the pop bands, most of the rock and the metal bands out there, it's it's pretty much a live show with maybe a you know small little embellishing things yeah. going on. Uh, for totally. the most part, it's a live show, and uh, but there's little things that happen, and guess what? No one cares about that. They want the experience. That's what's the most important thing at the end of the day. Let's embrace having a great show and celebrate yep. life with the concert that sounds like the record. Yeah. Yep. And by the no, way, the, you, you've noticed over the years, they've changed the name. We used to go to a concert. Now we go to a show. So yeah. it's really about the show and not about the concert, which yeah. right, I'm going to keep fun. calling the concert. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Old school. Never enough rarities and demos. The four LP box set. It's available now. You can pick that up at cleorex.com. Also, yep. November 12th. Make sure you get it. Hard Rock Night. Pre-order it. It's coming out. You're going to love it. You're going to dig it. And uh, Chip, man, this was really great to meet you in chat. Yep. We're going to have to do this uh, again. Jeremy, I seen you on with Mitch. I go, man, what? A, that's a one-two Robin. That's a Batman and Robin right there. You guys got a wonderful gift together. I, oh, wait a minute. Uh, Which one is the Batman? Which one is the Robin? You're I, Batman. I He's Robin, okay? Uh, I, 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 I knew you were there. Uh, guys, guys are more, more stuff is coming up in the future. I have a major tour I'll be announcing. Mitch, oh, you're going to hail it beyond belief. It's going to start in March. I can't really say anything about it. I want to talk so bad and, mm. and brag about it. Maybe I should. Uh, but then I, Give then us I, the I, exclusive. Give us the scoop. Text yeah, me later. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Let's just say that's going to be a tour next year. It starts. It's going to It'll be at the end of March. And it's going to be in the United States. It's coming over to Canada too. Nice. And it's going to be uh, a package. It's going to be a package tour, and uh, people are going to hail it beyond belief because, you know, there's some big tours that are happening next year that are going to be going on. That uh, yeah. uh, Tom Kiefer for Cinderella, L.A. Guns, and Faster Pussycat are going out next year in June and July. Wow. People are going to like to see that rock show, but. When's the last time you've seen bands like from the 70s and 80s getting together where it was a mix and a potpourri of, they might not be under the same umbrella as, as far as the group goes, but boy, the, the tour worked out great. I remember seeing Queen and Thin Lizzy open for them, and then they had uh, Bill Nelson's Red Noise, and I was like, wow, that's a great potpourri of bands, and I, you know, Foreigner and Alice Cooper and... Uh, Judas Priest uh, I mean, and Kiss went out for a while. Yeah, bon Kiss Jovi and Judas I mean, Priest yeah, went out. And Sammy Yellow Hagar Russian. and White Snake were supposed to do this. Yeah, Mahogany year. Rush and Kiss and Cheap Trick would be together. And bands you just go, yeah, hey, I'm not sure it's big. <laughs> and it worked out fantastic. Yep. This tour is going to be absolutely incredible. When in Rome, 
Bow, wow, wow, enough's enough and missing persons next year, folks. That's going to be incredible. Dale Bazio and a couple of original guys are missing persons as well. So that starts at the end of March, and we'll be celebrating, pushing that Beatle record as well. And hopefully we'll be able to take this show on the road for the next uh, uh, next yeah. year and a half. And hopefully yeah. you can come up to Canada. It's been a while. and uh... Yeah, Mitch, I want you to do my show. I'm on Monster Rock and the Dash Radio Network. Uh, we have yeah. over 800,000 people a day. Got Rudy Sarzo's got his own show, uh, Harlan. Yeah, uh, let's and, do it. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Carrie is on there. A cast of characters on there. Michelle, Claudia. It's a great team. We play nothing but hard rock and heavy metal 24-7, 365 days a year. It's A through Z, the whole alphabet of what rock and roll is all about. And I'd love to have you on there because you're very astute and you know about all the bands. And I think I, I, think I would uh, mm-hmm. drive you to tears because my playlist is incendiary. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> See, I, I, I would come on there and give you some of the uh, the British bands that or the European bands that people don't hear about too much. You know, your your Gothards and your Thunders and just sort of give a different flavor than... I play like, Gothards, I play Thunder, I play Mott the Hoople. I mix uh, it up on the show, bro. This is uh, not nice. terrestrial radio like... Little meerkats running in the and uh, hiding in their hole, playing fifteen to twenty songs a day. We're going through. I told you A through Z, the whole alphabet of hard rock and heavy metal. Oh, That's what it. people hail. So you might you might get hocus pocus by focus, but then I'm moving <laughs> all along, and I'm I'm going to give you Greta Van Fleet and Vintage Trouble and Rival Sons, and I'm going to throw some enough snuff in there. Maybe I'll throw Phil Lewis and L.A. Guns in there because yeah. they send me absinthe mm-hmm. and sugar, and I like to drink once in a while. It <laughs> yeah. doesn't matter who drives that bus. We're going to get to the picnic. Yeah, oh, that's exactly. Great. Mitch, you got to get on Monsters of Rock Radio, man. I do. I do. And by yeah. the way, just Jeremy, before we leave, uh, there was a time in Toronto where Enough's Enough was playing. And I believe uh, Sass Jordan and Butch Walker were at that show. Chip showed up in a dress and played the entire show in a dress. Nice. A- and the fans were, were confused. <laughs> I Chip- think I wore the dress well. I never... I haven't played a show in the, in the longest time. I did a whole Stephen Adler tour when I played with, when I played with Adler and Adler's Appetite, every night we're in South America, Peru, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, all the guys in the band, Steven especially, go, Chippy, you're going to wear the dress tonight? I mean, he <laughs> loved me because I would bring in the action. The women loved it beyond belief. And the guys don't care. Once you plug in, we open the set with It's So Easy, the fans, I hit them in the palm of my hand. It doesn't matter. The songs are so fantastic. Yeah. And then you got so, Mitch at the end of the stage just, like, trying to look up the whole time. Like, yeah, at the end of the day, who cares who's, you know, I'm, I listen so I like wearing dress. I, sometimes on stage, my favorite rock stars are very androgynous. Yes. So there's nothing wrong with wearing a dress. I think that's uh, it's, a, it's part of my vocabulary. Yeah. No, it was yeah. just funny because it, it, Toronto is a more sort of conservative part of Canada. And, and you came Listen, out and they, they just went. Mitch, when we came into the play of that show, by the way, <laughs> uh, uh, the road manager of Poison, because uh, we're on the Poison tour, then the yep. road manager said, his, uh, his name was Mark, he says, Chip, I want you guys to leave early and go through the border. I said, why? He goes, because they're going to search you guys. And I don't want to get tasseled. So it was it was warrant, poison, quiet, riot, enough's enough. So we left early after our performance and drove through. And as we st- were playing the Molson Amphitheater, and as we pull up to the thing, I go, guys, get in your bunks. I'll do the talk. And the driver pulls up. And the guy looks at me. He goes, yeah, identification. And I go to the, to the guy at the, the checkpoint. I go, hey, man, why don't you come see us at the show tomorrow? Uh, we're called Enough's Enough. I got Billy Corrigan on our new record. And I show him the CD. He goes, Billy Corrigan on your bus? I go, no, he's not. I go, but if you want to come to the show, and I hand him the CD. He goes, oh, man, thanks a lot. And he goes, uh, so what time's the show? I go, we're on 6 o'clock tomorrow. And he goes, fantastic. You guys go on through, man. I'll see you tomorrow night after I took his name. And we drove to the gig and, you know, put him on the guest list, of course. And we were carrying a Brinks truck full of extracurricular activities on this, too. Nothing bad. No Pablo Escobar. I think we had tons of booze and we, we were smoking Cheech and Chong all the way through until we pulled up to the border. And then Poison came through right behind us with Quiet Riot and, uh, uh, and Warrant. And they pulled the, all three buses over and searched those guys like with a fine. Yeah. Of unbelievable. I love that. Okay. <laughs> we got through there and they didn't. And then Donnie fell off the stage that day. Remember he broke his foot. Yeah. Fell off the stage at the show, uh, giving him, he didn't see, I guess it wasn't taped off. He couldn't see, he fell off the stage, broke his foot. We ended up finishing up that whole tour, but we had a guy named like a Dr. Landy that was with us. Okay. From Atlanta. And he, t- he took care of us and gave us all the treats that would to, to take care of the pain and make sure we got through that tour. It was supposed to be 73 shows on that, but then uh, rumor has it that Bobby Dow was uh, 
he met some young trim uh, at one of the gigs out in Belfu, South Dakota, and he heard and he hurt his back, uh, and we don't want to say what he was doing because that might be. Uh, <laughs> uh, I might well, the official awesome. story was a motorcycle accident or a motorcross yeah, accident. Yeah, or whatever. that's the official story. But the the real story is a Me Too movement one. We're gonna leave that one alone. But and wow. I was babysitting this kid Zach the whole time. I he'd asked me to watch Zach while he was out doing whatever he was doing. And then at the end of that, guys, no one even knows this. At the very end of that tour, when he hurt his back, he goes, "Hey, Chip, we might have to pull out of this tour." I go, "Why, bro?" There's 73 people on the crew. You got Warrant, you got Quiet Riot, Nuff Snub, all of us people. It's a fine, well-tuned oil machine. We're 44 shows into the tour. Why don't I just play the show? I won't wear a hat and shades. I know the songs. And then when you get ready and you, your back gets better, we'll finish up the tour. He goes, that's a great idea. He goes, all right, learn the tunes. So I learned all this. I learned the whole set. I'm great friends with CC. Get along with Bobby well. And uh, uh, obviously uh, the big stars of that band, you know, the singer. Brett and Ricky. <laughs> And Brett is fantastic. And Ricky would play with enough snuff every single night. He'd come up on stage and play. So I learned all the tunes. I thought, you yeah. know, we're going to Mark Hogue, the road manager, says, hey, this is going to be great. We're going to be able to navigate through this and finish up the gigs. And then a couple days later, said, up, oh, band's going home. That's it, guys. We're going to have Rat come in there and finish up. They're going to be the headliner. We said, oh, well, we'll, st- we'll still continue to do a tour. And I certainly wasn't mad. It wasn't like I was learning uh, yeah. Frank Zappa songs or Missing Person songs. I knew I could navigate that. So the Poison songs were fairly sesame street for me uh but yeah. i thought man wouldn't, wouldn't you're be playing crazy. beatles and poison uh, i would have yeah. loved to play i would have loved to have done that poison set for another 20 shows until or 10 shows or five shows whatever it would have been yeah so we had rat come out and then the promoters got mad about that because the draw wasn't as strong and they mm. ended up uh putting a fork in it and that was the end but but it was a great tour for enough snuff we were down our luck and uh an apa a guy named troy blakely called me at eight o'clock in the morning he says hey chip this is Troy Blakely. You guys want the poison tour? We had nothing going on. We couldn't get arrested if I was walking down the street with a rig in the middle in the morning. And uh, to get that break, that was really good for us because it helped put enough stuff back into the game again. And Mitch, nice. I had a lot of fun with you at that gig at that night because yeah, that we always come out every single show we, we play. You always come backstage. You always get on the bus with me. We always, uh, you know, there's a lot of fodder and a lot of subject matter to talk about. And I appreciate you and I appreciate everything you do for the rock and roll community. Yeah, and uh, we're passing on Mitch the torch to the Jeremy. Love. So Jeremy's going to be hanging out on the bus now and, and getting all your love. It's going to be great. It's going to be I fantastic. Hope, uh, well, Jeremy will bring some trimming. I know that because he's got a gift to gab. Hopefully, <laughs> Jeremy will come out to the show and get out and, and maybe sell, tell his constituents in Montreal to book enough enough because I'd love to go out there. I've always played Vancouver and yep. Toronto and Quebec, but I want to get out in Montreal because the trim out there is fantastic. Great and by the way, Jeremy is on. Line, great women. Jeremy's yeah. on two Toronto radio stations now too, so he's well, dominating. I'm gonna be. I'm not. I can't say the other one yet, but yeah. You're official. Okay, which which is the one you're officially on presently? Uh, I'm on Energy ninety five three, which is the the pop station. And then you're gonna be on another one that we can't discuss. We we also yeah. have our secrets, just like your secret tour. We have our secrets. Yeah, but my secret yeah. tour, you guys pulled the rabbit out of the bag. You guys have gotten out of me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're, missing we're, persons manager Howie Hubberman's not going to be very happy with me. I'll tell you that right no, now. There was but, you know, sometimes it's good to let the fans know they get excited about what the future holds. Okay, I'm yeah. for that. great touring awesome. next year. All the bands are gearing up for 2022. It's going to be like the wild wild west out there. And I want yeah. I'm great. I'm just grateful to be a small little speck on the radar of the rock and roll and heavy metal community. And that mm. tour is going to be incredible, folks. Starts at end of March, missing persons, enough's enough, one in Rome, and probably Bow Wow Wow. That's killer. Yeah, I want candy. Awesome. Let's do it. Yeah. There you go. There you go. I'm all Always in. a pleasure. All Toujours right. un plaisir, as we say in Montreal. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll keep in touch on Twitter and uh, we'll chat soon. Maybe we'll, ca- we'll hopefully we'll catch you on the road. We'll see you out there. Yes, Gentlemen, not- God bless you guys. Once again, a, a quick shout out at the end to our military, all our nurses, our doctors. The police, the firemen, and the local drug dealers across the street from 7-Eleven. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and, and a quick note, Hard Rock Night on vinyl is December 10th. We'll, mm. we'll end All on Beatles that. songs. It's Guys, it's a celebration of life. I hope you join us. We will. Yep. We're in. Cheers. Merci. All right. See you later. There God you go. bless. Bye-bye now.